I think Ryan Reynolds has incredible humor, incredible timing. I watched the documentary on Disney about the football club they bought, and he's not that different from like Deadpool, right? <laughs> but he's also just an incredible marketeer. On today's show, we're talking about five marketing-minded celebrities who built huge businesses from their fame. But you can take lessons from every single one of them and use it in your day-to-day -day life and your business and stick around because we're going to give some ideas on how each of them could make even more money if they listen to us. I'm your co-host, Kip Bodner, CMO at HubSpot. I'm joined by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan, who's the CMO at Zapier. And this is Marketing Against the Grain, your show for marketing-minded people everywhere. Let's get into today's show. Yo, Karen, we have a fun show today. We are talking about five celebrities that we love not for being celebrities. We love for their business brain and marketing skill. And it's an action-packed show, so I want to get straight in to our first celebrity, a woman who needs no introduction. <laughs> you love this person. The one, the only T-Swift. I love <laughs> T-Swift. I am the Swifty. I am here for it. I think she is amazing in every single way. Are you not a Swifty? Like the Swifties will come after you. I, I've only ever accidentally listened to the song because it might have been on radio, and I would not. I wouldn't even oh. really know if it was her song. Oh, Kieran! I you know I, I respect the grind. The like, sadness in your life. I, I respect, mean, that makes me sad. I think I saw a tweet that she's doing something like ten billion concerts or something like this. Like I respect the grind of how many concerts. Is that even possible? Isn't it like she's doing like what are you even saying? Isn't there something like she's doing five hundred concerts? And she's going to earn ten. Squillion, billion pounds. Like, there's something <laughs> ridiculous about the amount of concerts. Darren probably knows because he's in the music. No, I mean, she, she's not doing that many concerts. Maybe 100? I, I thought it was like a 246 or something. It was 100 to 200, I think, all in. Seems I, like I a lot of concerts. But I, what I want to talk to you about, Kieran, there, we, could, we could honestly do like 25 episodes on, on the on the money-making genius that is Taylor You Swift. could do it, but and I could react to it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell you the latest thing she did that I think is incredible, and I, you are going to appreciate it. Okay, so Taylor Swift, this summer in the U.S., launched her Eras Tour. And so basically every weekend she was someplace in the U.S. And this tour brought in $1 billion. Oh, my God. In the U.S. this summer, one billion dollars just in but the u.s just in the u.s all the international shows are still upcoming wow she's but it brought in a billion dollars in the u.s but what is incredible about this is a couple things like everybody can go on tour like that's fine that's cool like that's every, everybody can do that what she did that was different and unique is she did this tour she and it's the era tour because she did songs from all of her albums over the course of her career which, by the way, she's re-releasing re-releasing versions of her own album that she, she has that many albums herself. That she, yeah, dude, she has like ten albums. Not really? And well, <laughs> and, and for, it, side tangent, Scooter Braun bought all of her masters, and she got so mad at I him because he yeah. wouldn't sell them that she's re-recording everything. So she did a whole tour around songs from each of her albums to basically re-promote. The new recording she just did. I thought this was genius. Yeah, she has some like incredible business acumen. She re we recorded all her albums just to screw the person who bought her originals. I love that's that's like business cutthroat, some ruthless business acumen right there. And look, she's got ruthless business acumen. What I want to share with everybody about T Swift today is that she's also a pricing and packaging genius. Okay, so on this tour, she had. VIP tickets, which were crazy expensive, and you got like a bunch of birch, best seats, all that kind of stuff. Then you had your regular tickets. And then what she did is she recorded the Saturday night show she did in New York at MetLife Stadium. And normally when a recording artist does this, they like they'll record it, they'll hold it for a little while, and then they'll sell it to a streaming service, right? Not T Swift, baby. She is launching it in October live as an in-movie going experience at theaters all across the United States and I think the world. But what's interesting is people complain so hard that they couldn't afford tickets to her show because they sold out instantly. They, they totally got lost. 
And what she did was pretty genius. She said, great. I want to have a VIP package to my show for my super, super duper fans. Then my super fans are going to pay crazy scout prices to go to this show. But then I'm going to have this in movie theater experience, one that anybody can go to. It's basically unlimited supply. And she has these things about her concert, like people exchange fr friendship bracelets, get dressed up, all that. She's basically telling everybody to do that to the movie experience, too. Wow. So that she's basically syndicating a concert across a few weeks in America. And then she will sell it to streaming for the mass market who doesn't know anything about her to discover. So literally every part of society is going to learn about her, basically give her money in some way, shape, or form. From the, the lowest, get a little bit of money from a streaming service to then paying a ticket to go see her movie, to buying a concert ticket, to buying a VIP ticket. Like that is genius pricing and packaging for one, basically one three hour performance that she constructs. Yeah. So she's doing a couple of uh, things that most marketers can learn from. First of all, she is being an incredible content marketer because she's doing yes. one thing and repackaging it in multiple multiple ways. The second thing is if it ever goes wrong for T-Swift, I don't know how it goes wrong when you've earned a billion, but maybe she gets into the casino, she hangs around with Shamath and she goes on poker benders <laughs> and she just loses it all. She would be an incredible pricing and pack. She could actually go work with David Sachs and be a pricing and packaging expert for SaaS brands because she has like her company. She's an enterprise package. She has a pro package. She's a startup package. The only thing she needs to add to be a modern day company SaaS business is a freemium option, which sounds like maybe she packages up and puts parts well, of it. I think, I think, the, I think, well, no, I think her records, I think her albums are essentially freemium, right? Because you can hear oh, them on you the can radio, stream them, you right. can stream them, right? So I think all of her albums are like the freemium entryway point. And then if you like it, you kind of go up that ladder we just talked about, and she's monetizing you at every step of the way. Yeah, she has a tier, a price and tier for every single segment of her user base, which is what you need to do. And she's got, and she's got bonus points. Because you can be great at pricing and packaging, but if you really want to make all the money, you have to be not just good at pricing and packaging, you have to be completely vertically integrated. Right. You got to own all your stuff. T-Swift isn't out there doing licensing brand deals with all these big brands. Nope. She's got her own merch shop, her own experience. She owns it all soup to nuts. She is maximizing the margin of every single transaction that her fans make. It is genius. She's also integrated community in there. She's got people sharing the bands Huge you mentioned, uh, doing things with each other. So she is a marketing minded musician, right? Like she has the yes. perfect, she has the perfect intersection between creativity and marketing and business. And I think that is again, coming back to one of the shows that will be out and people can listen to, which is we believe the future belongs to B2B creators, creator led founders. And she's an example of a creator led founder, her creator, her passion is obviously music. And she spun that into some incredible marketing minded uh, businesses right there. Yeah. And she's done a great example of showing us vertical integration, pricing, packaging. It, she is basically the hardest person in the world to tell her how she can make more money. Honestly, <laughs> I, 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 I thought through all of the examples we're talking about today. She's kind of impossible. I think the way she does it is she does a week long festival and she tries to make a billion dollars in one week. Ooh, that's, that's the way. I like that. That is, that, the, that is the path for own the festival. That, like, of playing the festival. Like an, own ultra, the festival. like an ultra premium tier on top of what she's currently doing with her concerts. Like a week long thing where she gets all these other artists and it basically becomes the biggest like week long experience in the world and people travel and pay. God knows how much money. To right, that's the the kingpin creator aggregating the other creators to make more <laughs> yeah. money from them, yeah. and the other and the incentives align because the other creators want access Are to their audience. Money. They want access to distribution. This is distribution. Distribution is yeah. This is why every He's market, genius, every business should own as much real estate as they can, should own as much distribution as they can, because maybe not all of it converts, but you can leverage it in a multitude of different ways. Taylor Swift is showing you right that that right there, which and that idea, I can I have a ton of audience. I can leverage it through all of these different ways and give some people a distribution in return for them, giving me their time and effort for me to like maximize the amount of money I can create or I can get from this concert. So I think that is a great idea for Taylor Swift. Someone needs to tell her about that. Okay. Mine was to do celebrity poker. <laughs> You're supposed to do celebrity poker. Okay. Yeah, she could sit down at every think table. I not make any money doing that, man. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> uh, well, well, she's the hardest one because she, she made a billion dollars this summer. What, what, have, what have we been doing? Okay.
The second person we want to go, go through today uh, just passed away. Uh, RIP Jimmy Buffett. I uh, love Jimmy Buffett. Went to several of his shows. He was awesome. As somebody who doesn't live in America, Karen, you might be less familiar with Jimmy Buffett. So I'm I thought he uh, created, down. invented the buffet line. Before <laughs> Jimmy Buffet, <laughs> no one knew how to like stand in a group setting and all share food. Oh, Karen. <laughs> no, it hit me because I actually did not. <laughs> I feel really bad. I'm going to get like flamed out. All of the people we're oh, talking yeah. about today, I know. We were prepping do, for this show. I, do not know like, this I, know this I did not know this person. Okay, so Jimmy Buffett passed at 77 years old, and he was worth over a billion dollars. Okay? Crazy. And basically, he was a musician, and he got famous in the 70s and early 80s for basically what you would call now like country kind of pop music, which is very lifestyle-driven, very escape-driven. It's like, hey... I kind of hate my day to day. I'd rather be on a beach somewhere. And hey, oh, I want to be like this person, Jimmy Buffett, who is singing about being on a beach, having fun, doing those things, sailing on a boat, like the aspirational journey of all that. The thing that Jimmy Buffett did that anybody can go and take away, Taylor Swift, pricing, packaging, managing to extract as much value from your audience as possible. Jimmy Buffett was a very different. He was about understanding your audience. Because he knew that all of his audience were people like him. You know, they were aging members of the population who loved to have a good time, who wanted to escape, want to have fun. So what did he do, Karen? He created restaurants. He created retirement homes. Oh, nice. <laughs> he, he created hotels. Basically built an entire lifestyle brand that was only possible because he deeply knew his audience. He started a music he, for that audience. He started with music. He he grew up he grew up in Alabama, lived all over the US. Basically, basically he was living the remote work lifestyle before remote work was a thing. You know, he'd like live in Colorado a little bit, he'd live in Florida for a little bit and like he'd live on a boat. And basically people just wanted to be him because everyone was like, "Wait, I'm commuting every day. Listen to this guy. And this guy's living an awesome life." And so then he got people to basically want to be like him so much that he got them to like go to his retirement homes and like pay, him. pay him money, go to his restaurants and eat his food, drink his margaritas, all of those things. And all of it connected back to like his songs and lyrics in his songs. It was pretty freaking incredible what he pulled off over the last 30 years for somebody who was literally just like a singer songwriter um, to build a brand like that. I was reading about his passing uh, over the weekend there's a musical art artist named Jack Johnson. I don't know if yeah, you, I know. Uh, you, you know who Jack uh, yeah. Johnson is. You're going to love this quote because this is a marketing Jimmy Buffett quote. He, he, he had a quote. Uh, I think it was uh, on The Tonight Show or something. It was basically like, yeah, if Jack Johnson would let me do his marketing, he'd be worth a billion dollars. It was basically like the paraphrase <laughs> of the quote, which is like, it was basically like, I'm not that special. What I'm doing is not that The power special. of marketing. But I am really good at marketing. Now, right. You know, and he knew he was really good at marketing. And what I'm telling everybody can go take away is that he deeply knew his audience and he knew how to give his audience more and more of what they wanted. Right. It's like um, I, 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 would, I don't want to go down this path because uh, because, oh, no. of, because of the nature of politics in the U.S. But even in the U.S., uh, it is incredible to see some of the younger politicians there use marketing and cr like that kind of they basically create content by mm -hmm. truly understanding what the user segment wants to understand or wants to know. And they create that content in a multitude of different forms. How important it is to understand how to do marketing is way bigger than what most people think. Like it's way bigger than yes. doing it within the company that you think. It's like these musicians or politicians, they're using marketing mechanics to sell you a better vision of who you want to be. That's basically politics. So, although a lot of politics is becoming just regurgitate what you want to hear, uh, but regurgitate it and, and state it better than you've stated it yourself. But I love the fact that Jimmy Buffett created this aspirational lifestyle and wanted people or, and people wanted to live that. And then he gave them the businesses where they could go and do that, right? He gave them the restaurants, give them, you said the retirement homes. I said, really a, a great example of a marketeer understanding their user segment and being able to extract a maximum amount of value from that user segment because they truly understand how they can make their lives better. Yeah, R.I.P. Jimmy Buffett, you were amazing. Uh, I've been to Margaritaville. I've had a margarita at Margaritaville. It's delicious. It's also, he like had a good product. Like I'm, I'm just, just going to say it. It's, it was well done on, on all accounts. 
All right, we're going to go to somebody very different. This is my here. people. This is my pick. You're getting back the person into I want to be best friends with. Here in Flanagan person. All right. Ryan Reynolds. Oh, God. Ryan Reynolds worth over $350 million. Sold a mobile phone business to, to T-Mobile. Sold a gin brand. Like, has built and sold multiple successful companies. Owns an ad agency, right? Owns an ad agency. What? Do you think his secret is, Kieran? Because I think he's got something that literally everybody could go and take advantage of today. Uh, I think R- I think Ryan Reynolds has incredible humor, incredible yeah, exactly timing, incredible. He is who he is. I feel like he him like authenticity. Yeah, authenticity. I watched the documentary on Disney about the football club they bought, and like. He's not that different from like Deadpool, right? <laughs> like that, you know that that is who he, that who is who he is in some ways. Like obviously, it's an exaggerated view, but he's also just an incredible marketeer. Like his ads are incredible. The ads for the Jim Brown, incredible. Obviously, because he can interject humor, he gets internet culture. Like when he was actually promoting Deadpool, mm-hmm. he had a ton of great ads with David Beckham and all of these other celebrities, but just done in a way that was like on point. For, for what was uh, trending, the topics that were trending there and then. I think it's hard to replicate, but if you wanted to replicate it, like he has incredible, that deadpan humor, the ability to like insert himself into internet culture and trends that are topics that are trending, the ability to tell stories, the ability to bring his products to life. I think he's just, he's an incre- like, I, th- I think he's an incredible marketer. Well, okay. So, so, so first of all, there's a lot of humor, but one of the things that makes his humor so good, and you, we're kind of deadpan. touching on it, but I want to double down, is no, it's, it's not just deadpan. It is that it is very timely. Right. He is so good at understanding what culture is right. and reacting to culture right. really fast. And here are the two lessons anybody watching this can go and do. First of all, whatever you do, I can promise you your industry is boring because they all are. <laughs> they are. And this is not, this is not, this is not, a lie. All industries are boring. You can be the funny and creative right. brand in your industry and differentiate and make more money. And Ryan Reynolds has showed that with in mobile phones, in spirits, it totally works. The second thing is you have to be agile and react to culture, insert yourself into culture to really capture like the virality and possibilities of the internet. And once you once you've actually been ready to be humorous and you start down that path, then it's kind of being a student of culture and aligning to that culture to make it all happen. Right. 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 Yeah. I think this is, we've talked about this, which is why we believe that brands get disrupted in favor of, of creators. Even if brands just become the aggregate of the creators who work in your company, it's because I do feel we've already seen this in the B2C space. We're starting to see this into the B2B space. You will get swept aside if you are not part of the internet culture. You will get swept aside if you are yes. not talking on current trends. You will get swept aside if you are just like born bland and no one can resonate with you because you don't talk like other people talk like on the internet. We're living in the, the era of the internet. And so you have to be able to interject yourself into like the culture of the internet. And the creators who do that best build huge businesses. Like if you actually Huge. go through the list of creators, they are the ones who are able to do that. And I think he is an incredible example of, of being able to do it. He does that with humor. There's other ways you can do that. You can do that with points of view. You can do that with original thought. You can do that in a lot of different ways, great storytelling, but he like leads with humor, but it's still always with, as you said, understanding what the current trends are and being able to like link his brand perfectly, like bring his brand to life perfectly within those topics. Mm-hmm. All right. If you were going to tell Ryan Reynolds, he's worth north of 350 mil, you're going to give him some advice to get him closer to a Billy. What are you going to tell him to do? Sell the ad business. <laughs> get out of ad business. No, what would I tell <laughs> well, him? Well, the to- ad business is bad. I-, I have one. You want me to start? I would tell him selfishly to partner with Will Ferrell and bring back, what was the platform that was awesome? Let me just get it up. Oh, Funny or Die. You want Funny oh, or Die to come back. I want a version of Funny, Funny to die. die. That's a subscription-based service. Fun, it's called Funny or Die. And You want Funny or Die 2.0. And I want, him, I want him to bring in the best creator, comedy creators, to be like the faces of it. And then I want to have a subscription service where you can actually have new creators post their funny shorts mm-hmm. on there. And I want to be able to subscribe to that and have that platform back. I think he's the perfect face for it. I think that's a smart idea. It gets him into the advertising business, which he's already in, in a better way. So it makes a lot of sense. I have one other idea for you, Ryan Reynolds. I have an invitation. Come to us in B2B land. 
Spend more of your time in boring, very profitable, very efficient businesses because you've got the humor, you've got the marketing, you've got the differentiation. Go get involved, buy or partner in some boring ass market. <laughs> what, and would you put, what would you put them in? What market? B2B, can software. Software. I'm yeah, telling you, you software, could do it. I know. Ma manufacturing. And, and they have the boring B2B stuff that is super profitable. Like, why would he not get into that? He's doing this now. Like, alcohol was a good high margin business. Cell phones, not. When you're that good at marketing, it's about picking the right business to apply your marketing skills. Businesses that have a lot of growth potential and high margins, that's where he's got to be. Yeah. And most of those are boring, boring business. He could basically get a bunch of B2B operators, start a fund, do private venture for struggling SaaS companies. And then he could, he could take he could take $50 million of his own money and turn it to a billion dollars in a decade. And I agree. In, B, in B2B venture. If you had the right operators he, with him. He had the right operators for certain. Karen's curious, like, sign me up, bro. Dude, if I can work with Ryan Reynolds, I'd be a very happy person. <laughs> I used to have one drink with Ryan Reynolds. I'd be a very happy person. Okay. So Ryan Reynolds definitely bring in the marketing humor side of that. You all can do it. Remember, your market, your industry, boring. All right. Kieran, maybe our celebrity spirit animal, Reese Witherspoon. Because Reese is all about creating. She's all about media. She's, she parlayed an acting career into starting Hello Sunshine, where she produced a ton of shows and produced magazines, book clubs, did basically built an Oprah-style brand around herself from that acting career to basically do the media distribution creator play. This is the play that you and I love. We think it's a huge part of how you grow any business. And Reese has personified it in the consumer market. Agreed. I think uh, she has been able to leverage her, like start as individual creator, create films to actually become the production house, become the media house and build a real media network. I don't yes. know all of her products, but I've watched a bunch of her shows. I've read into her like media company. I think she sold it, right? To She sold her Hello Sunshine company to Blackstone backed candle or to Blackstone backed candle media for reported 900 million. Um, Ooh, and so she was really, that is some creator that distribution some money right Johnny Manziel. There. That's some Johnny Manziel money right there. <laughs> and so I think, th you know, another example of someone who's able to like create niche, expand niche, and then own the actual part above that, right? Become creator yes. and then actually own the publishing house, own the, own the production house. What Reese did well, and what I think everybody can learn from is once she adopted a media creator strategy, two, she had the audacity to see way bigger the opportunity. She basically asked her, herself the, the age-old question, what would Oprah do? She basically built an Oprah-like media model where she created magazines. She figured out the flywheel of distribution. She's like, oh, cool. I'm going to create these very expensive films. Right. But I need some way to get those films out there. Oh, if I had a book club, and I, I, love the book club if I was making a right. film, if I could, if I was making a film off of a book, then I could promote it in a book club right. and that would get people to my film. Oh, if I had a magazine, if I had other things I could do, then I could create this whole flywheel of distribution. And that's what she did. She doesn't think about her content or the story she's trying to tell in isolation. She thinks about them in the whole flywheel and universe of how to tell them and how to get as many people to see them as possible. And that's what everybody out there can and should be doing. You should be making like, one-off stuff, hit and publish, and stopping. You got to be like, all right, how can I be calculated? How do, how do all the work I'm doing, how does it fit together to maximize my audience out there? Yeah, you know what? This So actually, I will liken how we thought about the Hustle deal with a little bit about how Reese Witherspoon has thought about building her media empire and distribution empire. So one of the things that you and I have always said is we would rather own the real estate than rent in the real estate. Yes, and so if you think about yes. the typical career for someone like Reese Witherspoon, she actually is in the films and then she has a production house and then she has a streaming platform actually sit on top of that and then take their cut, right? Like create the film and then uh, distribute it to like streaming platforms. And what she really did is like, no, I'll just own the entire thing. Like I'll just like take, I'll star in the films, I'll produce the films and I'll do the deals with the platforms myself. And so I'll, I'll actually own the real estate versus just rent the real estate or have my brand used on that real estate. And I think that's an important lesson again for 
marketeers is like owned media. It's going to be more important in the future than ever, right? It's going to be more important to own your own digital real estate than ever, because as software gets commoditized, brands start look the same. You need to have a voice, right? Whether that's through video or podcast. The reason we do this is because we believe that. Right? The reason we do this podcast is because you and I believe this. And I think that if you take one thing away from her journey, as you said, it's really to own the real estate, own the distribution, own the owned media, because it's a really hard thing to get good at. And if you Very. have not even started, you're in big trouble <laughs> because I think it's going to be one of the things that every other brand looks to master. And so I think that's the lesson I would take from Reese Witherspoon is she realized that I should own the distribution. I think all of us uh, and brands will need to own their own media distribution outlet. I agree. And because she did that, her opportunity to make money is to just further monetize her brand, right. create, like get more into products, get into more high margin media, long form media, just keep doing more of what she's doing is how she's going to do that. Cause she's done the hard part. She's built the media distribution side of it. Kieran, we're going to talk about one more person before we close out the show today. I think this is a person you're a fan of. Oh yeah. And awesome video. Just in someone's house. Did you see that? <laughs> I, I missed oh, that. Oh, but, dude, you can talk, say who it is, and then I'll tell you the, the story. This this guy knows how to do this. We it, are about media. to talk about Dwayne The Rock Johnson, a.k.a. Can you smell what The Rock is cooking? Rock He's bottom. out there. He is doing his thing. He is one of the biggest stars in the world. Apparently, he gave somebody a house. Yeah, so he me? combined two of my favorite things, which is like rock being really nice to people and then UFC. So there was this incredible UFC fighter. <laughs> I think he's from uh, he's from maybe somewhere in Africa, Cameroon. I'm not sure. But yeah. uh, he had a really you know great story where he won a fight in the UFC. And this is indicative of some of the problems with the UFC, to be honest. But after the he won the fight, he said, all I have is $6 in my pocket. That's all the money he had, right? And so he had to win that yeah. fight. And there's a multitude of stories like that in, in UFC. And I think his whole family still is back where, where he originally lives. And so he was kind of coming to Vegas to train. And Rock is huge fan of the UFC, massive. And he uh, saw this story and he turns up with all of the cameras like following him and turns up to this person's gym and basically says to him, hey, like, uh, I, I, maybe I'm going to get you trainers or something that like, come with me. I can't remember what it was. Brings him into this house and says, I'm just going to stop here to get something. Brings him into a house. He guy walks into the house. In the house is pictures of the guy with his family uh, all, just, all oh. over the place. Oh, I'm telling you, like, I had some tears. And he's just like, <laughs> and he, this guy's so, get dusty in here. this guy's so nice. And he's like, what, 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 what why are these here? Why are this here? And then he, he opens the thing and he's got this thing of trainers, right? Like in sneakers and he's got all this gear for him. And he just goes, there's the keys. That's your house. And I was just, and you guys is like, what? Like, and the uh, man, anyway, incredible. That's pretty incredible. This is, this is a person who knows how to create emotional moments and does it from, I, I, I love like that. Think, that is the, the lesson that is, this is the lesson from the rock, right? right. Is he is great at aspiration and emotional oh, moments and incredible. anybody can create those and you can kind of break down anything he does to kind of see the intention behind it. Right. Right. It is hard to do that, but not impossible, right? And I think that is an ex well, example of someone who is able to really elicit incredible emotions across people, which he's done right well, from his me, wrestling career. Let me give you a formula that I think anybody can use to do what The Rock does, okay? First of all, I think you and I can agree, if you are only rational, you will never do what The Rock does, right? Because The Rock inherently does irrational things. If, if as your business or if you're an entrepreneur, if you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm obsessed with ROI. I'm obsessed with making the math perfectly work all the time. Then you would never, if you only look, do what The Rock does, but you, you're never going to have an emotional connection with right. your customers. You build emotion, emotion through irrational, inherently emotional things. And so what you have to say is, who is my audience? And what is something I could do to completely surprise them and blow them away? And what happens is if you keep just answering that question over and over again, you build up so much brand equity and goodwill that the ROI and monetization follows, right? But you have to do that for a while to be that aspirational, emotional brand that people want to be a part of. Right. We went from a marketing era offline that was very creative led, like some of the best copywriters that yeah. are still cited today were pre-internet oh, era. And the reason the they were pre-internet era is because it was much more of a creative led process. When we went to internet, it became much more 
it, the like it was the kind of the intersection of that creativity and, and science and really why I enjoy marketing because I like to live in the middle of those two things. But I do think like over time, maybe we've shifted a lot into the science, right? All brands get pushed in the middle. Everything gets yeah. bland because we look at the metrics. We only care about the metrics. I, I think you and I showcase something live at Inbound. That episode is going to come out soon where we think marketing is going in the future. But I think the lesson I would learn here is we have gone far too much in the direction of science. Now, I do think that we are going to get pushed back to creativity, whether we like it or not, because of privacy yes. concerns, Preach. because of the data Preach, concerns. Preach. Like we're, we're going to be forced to. I've seen, I've read up so many, I've been reading up so much on like, we're just not going to have the data we used to have. So we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to just get used to having much more correlation versus causation. And I think that could be a good thing for the marketers who can elicit raw re emotions from content and from their brand in the way that rock is able to do. Look, faith and hope are important things. They're how you build an emotional brand. They're also how you get off of the hamster wheel of just looking at spreadsheets and doing 100% rational marketing. Not that you shouldn't do a lot of rational marketing, you should, but if it's all the marketing you do, you're never gonna build emotional connection and that's what we can learn from The Rock. The Rock's amazing. The Rock just makes more money from just keep doing Fast and the Furious, I yeah. guess, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, he's extended it to tequila and other brands. He's gonna keep building brands and-, and, and Dude, Conor McGregor showed every equity. celebrity that they should actually have a spirits brand. Like you have to give him credit oh, for that. Totally. I know he wasn't the first, but wow, he uh, he blew that up. No, really George George Clooney and Randy Gerber with Casamigos P. Diddy. were really one of the P. early ones. P. Diddy, P. Diddy was Diddy. one of the first, yeah. but vodka, wasn't he? So, so those are five celebrities we all love, we, th we think are awesome people, but have that marketing mindset and use that to really drive growth well beyond their career, well, well beyond what the average person who does acting, does music, does whatever, should make. They're, you know, T-Swift made a billion dollars last summer. Ryan Reynolds is worth over $350 million. Race and he's, he's just getting started, right? Like it is crazy. crazy. So take those lessons, apply them to your business. Tell us who you think your best market, the best marketing minded celebrity out there that we didn't talk about is leave them in the comments, hit subscribe on YouTube, leave them in the comments. Who else should we have covered? If we do another episode like this in the future, who else should we talk about? If you're a fan of the show, come check us out over on connect.com. We're hosting a community for a limited time there where we're answering your questions and giving some of the latest news and scoop on the show. So go to connect.com today and join the marketing against the grain community. We will see you all very soon on Marketing Against the Grain. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better.